and welcome to Wine Library TV. I am your host, Gary Vayner Chuck. And this is Wine Library TV. So we're gonna go a little old school, a little backtrack, a little former Soviet Union on your ass today. We're gonna do old world wines because a lot of people have been asking for them. And we're gonna go a little more traditional on WLTV, talk about Bordeaux and Burgundy and a little Alsace for the kids out there. So I'm really excited about the wines we have lined up. We even did five, favorite number. Throw up the big five sign for me. Um, and I'm really excited about these wines and we're gonna get into them in a little bit. But we're gonna do something, uh, we're gonna start doing this more often or I'm gonna try to. We're gonna do a question of the day right off the top. I said I'd incorporate questions more often. We do have the ask.winelibrary.com thing all the way up here in the top your top right corner, and uh, please check that out, please ask questions, and please, more importantly, answer people's questions. It's wonderful to see the community efforts up there, people have been doing great jobs. So, BevDub asks, serving temperature on Pinot Noir. And so, you know, serving temps on Pinot Noir are very, you know, is the question, and it's a very interesting one, nice. Um, serving temperatures of wine are really the same way I look at wine in general by itself. It's really a preference thing. It's really how do you like it. I know a lot of people say that a great serving temperature for Pinot Noir is in that 58 to 62 range. People really like that range for it. I, I, a lot of people love bringing out the red wines from their cellar and popping it. I am far more a room temperature guy. I really, really do prefer most of my whites, even some whites, at dead room temperature. It's where I feel comfortable, it's what I like, and, and I just feel that aromatically, those kind of wines do a lot better. Uh, I think uh, that is a big part for me. So, you know, I really don't think there is a perfect temperature for any wine, I really don't. I think it comes right down to uh, preference. I mean, is there a perfect temperature to eat pizza? I know I, for one, love it cold the next day. I don't think that's clearly the ideal message that the pizza industry is starting to, or wanting to uh, send, but that's where I'm at. And so, room temperature with wine, I go with whatever feels good. Whatever you like, Bev Dub. Okay, so we'll get, let's get into some wines, um, because that's what we do on WLTV. And we're gonna start off with the uh, Domaine Oster Tag, 2004 Franholz Riesling from Alsace. This is 28 US dollars, and it is 90 points wine spectator. When I think about old world whites, I mean, of course we can talk about Burgundy, but to me, there is no finer place, especially this time of year, and we brought out the big glass for kicks and giggles today. There's just no better place to, uh, to appreciate and adore tradition like uh, like Alsace. Uh, Riesling is such a great grape, so underappreciated. We've talked a lot about that on WLTV, all you new vaniacs and all you lurkers. I know you're out there. Um, I, we're really excited about Riesling here in the Gary Vaynerchuk world, me personally, because they're just excellent, excellent wines, really expressive. Uh, they tend to get pricey, it's 28 bones, so it's not inexpensive, but food-wise, they complement so well. So let's give this a whirl. We've got some nice little color, not too, too dark, but nice little pale white straw kind of color to it. Let's give it a whirl, and here's where Riesling really dominates. I'm excited about this. Very nice. I'm getting really nice rounded pear flavors, a little bit of apple. Getting a hint of petrol, uh, which is very common in Rieslings. I'm also getting a very clear cut jalapeno pepper aspect on the nose, which I really adore, it's really nice. Little dips of honey sprinkling on the nose as well. Very aromatic, very interesting. Not explosive, not taking over the room. It's much more concise and, and focused and uh, humming through your, on, on your nose really nicely. Nice, let's give it a whirl. Oof. Really intriguing lemongrass blast when you first taste it. Almost like, you know, lemongrass and then almost like on top of that, then biting a fresh lemon. I mean, this is fresh squeezed lemonade at its finest, wine-wise. Um, nice mineral aspect, very bluestony, shellfishy. Uh, walk on the beach on those nice little, you know those beaches that have a lot of like rocks on them? Like, just, but they're nice, they're soft, you like them? I like them too. Um, it's coming across that way. Very clean, very crisp, very precise, extremely lemony, extremely. Oh. 
It even has a smell of Mr. Clean on the way coming in. And it's got that, you know, that fresh lemon, you know, do your floors with, not the pine, but the lemon zest. Um, don't know all the household products, but I'm sure it's one of those. Um, nice nice body, very crisp, very clean, a uh, good solid effort. I'm gonna go with the spectator on this. I'm gonna go 90 points, but I have to be honest, for 28 bones, there is a whole lot of other Rieslings from Alsace and from Germany that I think are better QPRs in the 15 to 18 dollar range. So I am gonna give this wine a pass. Though it is an exceptional bottle of wine and if you ever see it on a list or ever seek it out or if you go to a store and you don't know what to buy and you see this, you should definitely seek it out. Ostertag is one of the great producers in Alsace and this is a pleasure to drink. Once again, just a little bit concerned about the overall price quality ratio of the wine. Now before we get into the reds, uh, let's talk about a couple links because Chris Mott, you know, he's interested in doing some work. So, link time. First link, right over here. One of the interesting personalities of 2007 for Gary Vaynerchuk. God, I'm talking third person. Somebody made a joke, emailed me, and now I can't stop. I can't stop! This wonderful gentleman named Kennedy that I met runs this amazing site called Ask a New Yorker. I met him at a video conference thing, and uh, he was nice enough to pick me as the New Yorker of the month and did a little profile, a little bio. So check it out right here. Uh, our, uh, our conversations online, it's a great site. Forget about me, I mean check me out, but check out this site. It's pretty darn cool. I spent a good two hours on it last night. Some really rad, old school, fresh stuff on this site. Um, also, huge, huge shout out to Carolyn and Aaron. They got engaged. She said yes on her 28th birthday. 28's a great number because Curtis Martin is the greatest football player of all time. So Aaron, Carolyn, congratulations. It's a big day in somebody's life. Lizzie, remember we got engaged once. Um, what else, what else do I wanna talk about? Should we do, you know, we'll do the first wine and I'll stop again and talk about more stuff and let's start with Bordeaux. Um, now we're interesting, we're doing a Bordeaux and then we're gonna do the Pinot Noirs because the Pinot Noirs are very big it's not always that you want to do Pinot Noir before Cabernet and Merlot based wines, so in this case we're not. So we're going to do Chateau Franc Malay 2000 vintage, which is a classic vintage, Pomerol. This wine is 90 points wine spectator and 30 US dollars. Not yen, not rubles, but US bones, 30 of them. Let's give it a little rinse McGinn's and a pour. Now this is on paper a steal. 30 bones, 90 points, and from one of the classic vintages. I don't put it in the 2005 range, but I put it right here. You know, it's kind of like McEnroe Borg. I mean, you know, real tough, real close. But for me, I'm going to go with the 2005 vintages overall. But obviously it's 2000, it's much more mature now, it's ready to drink, and that should be interesting. Really dark, dark color, very nice Pomerol. You know, home to some of the great wines in the world. Merlot. Uh, heavy on this wine. Classic old worldness. Uh, God, think of Grandpappy's pipe, you know, on this, that tobacco, but like, you know, like the pipe, no tobacco's in it now. It's kind of like all like, you know, charred out and, you know, it's like 97 years old, the pipe, and it says like, you know, Red Sox 1908 champions, or, or is that the Cubs one? 1908, I think it's Cubs actually. Cubs, you know, like it's that old, but it's got that old residual tobacco flavors coming through. That's what this nose has. Alongside very clear like blueberry cupcake aspect. I'm getting a very like blueberry cupcake, hostess blueberry cupcake aspect because I'm getting a hint of blueberry, but mixed in with like a kind of artificial chocolate flavor. Very nice nose with all that. Old world fans, come on in and get cozy with me. Let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya because this wine brings the thunder old school style. Because what's really intriguing about this wine is that it's very lush and heavy but has no artificial fruit bomb flavors going on whatsoever. Much more earth driven. Give me green, yellow, and red peppers because it looks pretty. And a really concise focused sour cherry flavor that's so well integrated with the peppers, with the body, with the little hints of dark chocolate that I'm getting and a nice long finish. As a matter of fact, this wine actually made me 
crave a dessert as I finished it. And let me tell you a little bit about my palate. I'm that guy that eats coffee ice cream. Addicted. Give me a shout out if you love coffee ice cream. Eats coffee ice cream and then runs to the fridge to eat a pickle. I need that balance. And I go the other way as well. But it's really obvious when it's sweet and sometimes the other way it happens. And in this case it went the other way. This is so austere and dry and earthy, you know, like chalk dust coming through a little bit on the finish, I'm tasting it right now, that I'm running for like a chocolate tart or something of that nature. Very well polished, very well made. Classic Bordeaux, it's pinpoint. I mean, concise celery stick flavor that was dimmed in a little bit of a Bloody Mary, but you just love the celery and you ate it before you even started on your Bloody Mary. You get a little bit of that piece of celery, that special kind. Uh, good wine. I think Spectator nailed this. I'm gonna go 91 points actually on this one. I really like this. For 30 bones, it's an absolute out and out bargain um, because Bordeaux's gotten very expensive and 2000 is a very exceptional deal. And if you're looking for an old world wine to uh, see if you like them, this is definitely one to seek out. Very, very good effort. That was fun. You know when you hate being a nice guy? And this is where I hate being a nice guy. I promised Jess to give a shout out. Link time, Ma. I promise, or down here if you're not watching today. I promised Jess to give a shout out to the New England gathering that they're doing. I will not be there, I have a conflict, but uh, a lot of Aniacs up in that New England area are getting together and having a tasting. So if you're watching and you're not part of the forums, you don't know about this because we have a Wine Library TV meets place there, a lot of offlines going on there. And if you're in the New England, Boston, New Hampshire, Rhode Island area, here's a link. They're looking for more people, they've got a good amount, it should be a great time. Obviously the disgust in my mouth of the Randy Moss trade and the fact that if the Patriots lose a game next year, I'm going to be surprised is uh, it's bringing me down and makes that statement not so much fun. But I promise Jess, there it is, Link. Let's move on. We're gonna do some Burgundy because nothing is more old school than Burgundy. I mean, Burgundy is like your great grandma's great grandma. It's like tradition at its finest, old school, very, very intriguing place in the world. Everybody should go to Burgundy if you're serious about wine. You will get a total different outlook on what's going on there. It is medieval. <laughs> This is the Louis Jadel, which is a big producer, but produces some great high-end burgundies. Clos Vigeau, Grand Cru, 2001 vintage, 80, excuse me, 74 US dollars. Big shout out to Mangold, uh, Nick Mangold, number 74, best center in football. 74 US dollars, 88 to 91 points, Alan Meadows, the Burghound, one of the great critics of burgundy in the world. And Clover Show is a very interesting area, very small little area. About 80 different owners have uh, the rights to the Clover Show area and, and pick the Pinot Noir. All red burgundies are Pinot Noir. Um, you should know that. And uh, this is a very intriguing place in the world. These wines get expensive. Clover Show gets way up there. Some of the wines are two, three, four, five hundred dollars a bottle. So, really nice color actually for a Pinot Noir. You can still see your uh, fingers through it. So, it's got that classic. Pinot Noir coloring, not like some of the new explosive stuff we're seeing out of California. And here we go. Wow. This, it's been a long time since something's been dead pinpoint. This wine smells exactly like red radish. I mean, I don't even know what means, but whatever it means, it means exactly. This is like diced up mashed down red radish, and I love red radish. I used to eat radishes with kielbasa all the time, like my three o'clock in the morning, wake up, hungry thing. That would be it, I'd get in like two of them, I would never wash them, my mom would get pissed. But red radishes and kielbasa, this has an enormous amount of red radishes. Red radishes is a huge Russian, Belarusian thing, so I'm sure that's why I was so exposed to it. I noticed a lot of my American friends didn't have red radish. Once in a while you see them in a salad, but I pop them like pills. I love them, and then this wine has it, so I'm pretty excited at this point. Most of you won't be. This has enormous amounts of mud and earthy tone flavors, uh, really like scooping up a good pile of soil in your yard and just munching on it or smelling it. Very dirty. It's got a hint of Jersey Turnpike trash. I mean, I know that's what we're known for in a lot of parts of the world. It's here, it's a little here, but all in all, very intriguing. 
but classic burgundy. Very dry, little hint of bitterness, little off balance, a little thin. Um, good shot of like tartness that I think is gonna bother a lot of people. There is some polished Pinot Noir flavors. I like some silkiness of it. I actually do get a ten of a, uh, a little hint of, ra of uh, strawberries in here. Fresh picked strawberries, long stem strawberries. It's nice actually, it's really the big component of the wine that's really saving this from being a complete disaster. But there's a zinger. And you know, zing, it's coming through and it's bothering me on my palate. I think a lot of people will not enjoy this. Wine's been open for several hours at this point. Mm hmm. There's just a sour tartness. It's off balance. The tan is just a little too dry and not enough fruit. Maybe the lack of fruit is the real issue in this wine because those tannins and, and acidity are nice and firm and I like that, but the fruit is underwhelmed. You just can't see the beauty. You know, it's like it's like so many things in this world. They have a little piece of beauty, but the ugliness is covering it up too much. Like a pretty girl with a horrible personality. That's what this wine is. I'm gonna give this wine 87 points. It's under underdeveloping for me. Um, and obviously a, a major pass at 74 bones. I like that pretty girl with a bad personality. That was good. Let's move on. This is the 2004... Uh, uh, Robert Grofier Bone Mar, and this is a very, very serious bottle of wine. This is 140 US dollars, 90 to 93 points, Stephen Tanzer, and Bone Mar is one of the great areas in the world for wine, um, one of the top spots within um, all of Burgundy, 37 acres are planted in the Bon Mar. Only 72,000 bottles produced each year. Really small production. Um, within town, the village of Chambon Moussigny, this is a completely spectacular area of the world. Some of the great wines I've ever had have come from Bon Mar. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about trying this wine again. 140 US dollars. You're talking about serious, serious juice. Really nice color. Again, classic Pinot Noir. You can see your fingers. I like when you can see your fingers. Wow. All right, now we're talking about a totally different class of wine. Beautiful ripe nose, I get a little pickle juice. You know I love that. Really obvious sardine element coming through on the nose and anchovies. I'm getting very fishiness. I'm getting the anchovies and sardines both mixed together, hanging out, having fun together and, and they're really, really obvious on the nose. Little hint of soy sauce, again, real spicy pickle flavor. You know, it smells like a deli pickle, like the bucket, it really does. Nice, really intriguing. I'm also getting a little bit of raspberry and a little hint, little tiny hint of like skunk. A little skunk, a little skunk walked by. You know, it didn't zap you. You know, went by, you were like, whoop, you froze, it went by, you didn't get zapped, and you're like, but you can still smell the skunk a little bit. It's kind of like a skunk just went by, a little bit, just a hint. It's bringing charisma to the nose. Let's give this a whirl because this has a chance. This nose is rocking. New World fans, leave the premise. For the first time, you're all cozy. You probably even have a dent in your chair. You're gonna need to leave. This is old school time, very, very interesting. What polish this wine has. This wine has such an elegant silkiness to it, it just completely rolls down my palate. Very long finish, still tasting it. Almost like a cherry cola flavor on the finish, which is extremely, flattering for this wine and very, very delicious. I mean, beautiful flavors. I am craving duck right now like you would not believe would be an amazing pairing with this wine. This is special stuff. Tremendous tannin structure, makes me believe this wine will last for 25 years, easy. But what it's showing right now at this youthful stage, 
I mean, it's like the 40 year old that can do a Rubik's Cube in about 10 minutes. That's what this tastes like. Um, tremendous elegance, great round cherry. Once again, cherry cola, very obvious. A lot of those sardini, fishy, skunky things kind of go away in this wine. Still hint a little bit. I am getting a little bit of green beans uh, on this uh, on this mid palette, which is really elegant. Beautiful silkiness. Wow, I'm just blown away by the silkiness. Um, tremendous, tremendous leather tobacco flavor. Hits you right away and then goes away. Almost like a shoe polish aspect also on the mid-palate of this wine. This wine is not giving me a headache. This wine is getting me awfully exciting. This is a very serious bottle of wine and extremely well made. Um... I'm gonna score this wine 94 points. This is exceptional to me. This is exactly what I look for in an old world wine. It's got tremendous uh, characteristics, beautiful earthy tones to it. It's like an old shoe that you bite, but you thought you were gonna eat an old shoe and you just tasted a beautiful smorgasbord of fruits, tobacco, and other earthy tones. I really like this wine. This is for old world fans, but it's damn expensive. So hopefully you're either carrying a black card and you can afford this, or Put it on the boss when you see it. Robert Grofier is a tremendous producer of all sorts. He makes a lot of wines underneath this that you should seek out, but this 04 Beaumar is something worth putting away for a very special occasion. I do believe this will easily last 20 plus years, so if you want to buy a bottle of 04 for somebody that was born or your wedding or anything like this, this could be really interesting. It's gonna be crazy stinky by there, by then, but if you're into wine now and you're still into wine 20 years from now when you pop it, you're going to appreciate that stinkiness, I guarantee it. Awesome. Whew, that was fun. And now, we're gonna really finish off this tasting in style, and I'm pretty damn pumped. Wow, that wine's oh, kinky. All right, let's do this. This is the Chateau Sudero, 1990. A classic Sauterne vintage, 1990 Sauterne. This is 33 US dollars for a half bottle, 95 points Wine Spectator, but interestingly enough, 88 points Robert Parker. So I'm excited to kind of break the tie, as they say. I'm trying to think, is there anything else I want to talk about? Yes, there is. The uh, videos that were put in for the VO contest have been outrageous. And there was a couple that I wanted to give a shout out to, but one specifically today. Huge link time. <laughs> Over there or down here, depending on when you're watching. Um, this video was extremely well done. And this is the uh, tasting in Transylvania. Please seek this out and give a big shout out to her. She killed it. Check it out. She brought the thunder and then some. All right, let's give this a whirl. Now, one thing you'll notice with Sauterne, and you might find very intriguing, is Sauterne goes through a color stage. When it first comes out, it's very bright and yellow. But then as it ages in the bottle, it starts to become more copper and orangey as it goes on. And who doesn't love a little orangey beverage in their mouth? So I'm going to try this wine, and I'm very excited about it. Sudero is one of the great producers in all of Sauterne, um, and, and, you know, this is... Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, Blend Late Harvest, um, some of the great dessert wines in the world from this area, Sauter. Let's give it a whirl. Very intriguing on the nose. I almost get like a rusty copper penny, and not because of the visual, but visual, 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 visual. The visual, um, just getting a little bit of that steely kind of coppery kind of metallic wetness that I get sometimes. I'm also getting a clear cut uh, aspect of a, a little uh, what I call pineapple oil. Bear with me. It is truly a uh, imaginary blend between gasoline and pineapple juice. I get it often in sauternes. It's in a lot of my tasting notes, and this is pineapple oil on the nose. I'm also getting a very obvious, distinct butterscotch on the nose. Probably the dominant flavor. I really got a real whiff of it there. Real obvious butterscotch coming through as well. So, butterscotch, pineapple oil, and a copper rusty penny. Let's give it a whirl.
That was tough to spit. Easiest tasting note of my life. Take a mango, pour maple syrup on it, a glop of brown sugar, and a little hint of hot butterscotch. Bite it. Deliciousness, that's what this tastes like. Wow, clear cut mangoes, enormous amounts of maple uh, syrup, and very obvious brown sugar flavors coming through on this wine. Finishing with an apricot reduction sauce flavor. This is a beautiful wine. I am far more closer to the wine spectator than I am on Parker. I think Parker completely misses this wine. I don't know the last time he rated it. It could be a long time. This is 1990. Again, a classic vintage. Uh, I'm going to score this wine 92 plus. I think it's an outstanding. I think Spectator got a little bit crazy on it too, but this is an outstanding bottle of mature Sauterne. I know a lot of people have not had the chance to have mature Sauterne, and at this price point, Sauternes expensive. You should absolutely seek it out because new Sauternes are coming out more expensive than this. 33 bones for this kind of wine, 92 plus for me, absolutely excellent. I'm gonna take another sip. But wait a minute, that was too much sugar for me so now you know what I have to do because that's my palate, maybe not yours, but my palate, when it gets a little bit too much sugar, it needs to go to the opposite end of the spectrum and what I'm, I'm craving right now is a beautiful pickle and a dirty shoe and insects is beautiful. And by the way, you want a fun lesson? Taste wine after tasting a dessert wine. When your palate gets coated with sugar, how different these wines taste. Question of the day. Excluding people, no grandmas, great uncles, parents, Excluding people, what is your favorite old school thing? Because you, with a little bit of me, like this much, we're changing the wine world, aren't we?